Hello, everyone, and welcome to this uh, CCAN webinar. My name's Pete Barbara Johnson. I'm going to be the host today. Um, I'm also doing a little bit of talking myself. Um, before we dive into the, the real content for this, the webinar today, let me say a few words about CCAN. Um, so CCAN um, is the Center for the Evaluation of Complexity Across the Nexus. There's a lot of words in there. What we're really doing, I think, our core aim over the last uh, several years now, since 2016, we, we started, has been developing and testing new methods for policy analysis and policy evaluation. And those methods are methods that are underpinned by a complexity science or systems thinking type of approach. Um, we've tended to work very much at the ex post end of the, end of the spectrum on, on evaluation, and also uh, tended to work on environmental and energy policy domains and work very closely with, with government departments in those those areas. But CCAN does have a broader focus that we are interested across the policy cycle and across different policy areas. Um, as I say, we've been running since 2016. So there's a lot of work already out now from CCAN. So if you look on our website, there's a huge number of, of reports and publications, toolkits, uh, other sessions like today, webinars been recorded. So do have a look on there for, for things that, that might be interesting. Uh, CCAN is still very much alive and kicking, and there's a, a fellowship scheme that is going to be starting up again very soon, and there's where there'll be funding available to have CCAN fellows, so have a look out for that. There's a, a lot of events coming forward, and there will be more of our, our briefing notes and policy papers coming out in due course, so do keep checking back uh, on the CCAN website. Um, the structure for today is a few of us are going to give a, a, a talk for about 45 minutes, so we should have a solid 10 if not 15 minutes for questions um please put your questions in the q a box it should pop up in the zoom uh the zoom window hopefully we're all fairly familiar with that nowadays so yeah put your questions in the q a box you can vote on questions you see so feel free to upvote questions you think look good and you'd like to see answered um and then i'll put those to the to the, to the panel of us presenting today. We won't put any of you on the spot and ask you to turn your camera on suddenly to, to ask your questions to us. Um, and lastly, people always ask, so just to confirm the slides will be available, the session is being recorded, it will be up on the CCAM website uh, very soon, probably in the next day or so, if not if not even quicker. So let's get, let's get started then. Um, so we're gonna be talking today about new economic models of the energy transition. And this is really, I think, a lot in common with work. This is not work that's been done directly as part of CCAM, but I think has a lot in common where we've been using, as part of this EAST project that I'll introduce, we've been using complexity and systems approaches at the kind of ex ante policy appraisal stage before policy is implemented, thinking about their, their economic and wider impacts. Um, so, I'm going to give a quick introduction to this project East. Then we're going to hear about a few of the examples of the modeling. Fernanda, one of my colleagues from Oxford, is going to be talking about a model uh, of the labor market. Then Fenke from University of Exeter is going to be talking about uh, solar power and how it might be dominating the energy system in the future. We're then going to talk about uh, risk opportunity analysis, which is a kind of wider framework beyond individual modeling methods. It was going to be Simon Sharp, who's a really key figure in East, uh, talking to us about that. Unfortunately, he's unwell today. So I'm going to do a, a kind of a hacky job of, of talking about risk opportunity analysis. Um, and then I'll bring things to a close. And I just wanted to say a few words to try and connect what's happened in CCAN in East and thinking about how we, how we use these methods and these ideas to connect across the policy cycle. So we're not always thinking ex ante and nothing else or ex post and and nothing else uh, yeah. and then we'll, as i say we'll have time for questions so the east project another horrible long acronym i don't come up with these i'm sorry uh the east stands for economics of energy innovation and system transition and what we really are doing which i think you can see the mirror uh, to ccan is developing and applying new economic modeling for the energy transition, uh, trying to develop a new co cohort of models, of uh, largely simulation models, but not only, which can be used in ex ante appraisal to help us understand what might happen 
with different policies. Um, East is funded by directly by the UK government, but also by the Children's Investment Fund Foundation, which do a lot of work under climate because of their focus on on children and the future. Um, and we've been it's not there's a lot of UK universities involved, but there's also really importantly, academics and policy partners in each of China, India, Brazil uh, and the UK. And also we have done a lot of work looking in the, at the EU. Um, about how they use modeling. We haven't done so much new modeling for the EU, but really looked at how models fit into the policymaking process in a quite reflexive manner. We've done that in the EU. Whereas in China, India, and Brazil and the UK, we've we've done a lot of new modeling with our policy partners and with academics in those in LC in the UK, but in China, India, and Brazil as well. Um, there's a whole again similar to CCAM, there's a whole bunch of reports already out. You can see some of the front covers there. I'll, I'll talk about those a bit. We really started off with um, trying to look back at what's happened in the energy transition already and what we can learn from that. So it's a kind of empirical piece of work in one sense, where we've looked back at policies that were very successful, whether it be the energy vendor in Germany or solar support in China or wind policy in the UK or LED lighting in India, like some of the, some of these bright sparks of, 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 of good stories about the energy transition and trying to understand why they have happened and really the conclusion we came to was that these policies have been implemented and des designed and implemented despite the prevailing economic advice the cost benefit analysis and it and its ilk saying that maybe these policies weren't weren't advisable or maybe the costs would be too high so p decisions have been made and successes have been had over the last kind of 15 years despite that traditional economic advice then in our second report um, which was more uh, focused on thinking about principles and kind of th developing some clear th theory, but underpinned and backed up by all this empirical work we've been gathering. Um, the second report put forward 10 principles for policymaking in the energy transition. And here what we're trying to do is, is take those lessons from the past and think what that means for how we, how we go about making policy and of course, the report has a handy list of 10 and, you know, there's a there's a, a screen like this where you see them just listed, but then there's a lot of detail behind them. I just wanted to draw your attention to two to, uh, today to give you a sense of them. These number four and number six that I've highlighted here. So if there was a traditional principle, a kind of standard economic advice that carbon pricing was very important and that we just need to price carbon appropriately and then the energy transition will kick in. So that I think that's you know that's one some people might argue with that but that's one way of uh, articulating traditional economic advice in this kind of new way of looking at the energy transition more underpinned by a systems and complexity approach the new principle is to target tipping points and so not to say just find a carbon price across the whole economy but say look in those sectors where there's the the seeds or the perfect storm coming together where those technologies might be ready to be deployed at scale rapidly and where different sectors might be linked, where there might be technologies that can be deployed across different sectors. Look for those tipping points, look for where the system is primed for our interventions and target policy in those ways. Another way to think about it might be that for number six there that policy can be thought of as optimal we need to find the perfect policy and there'll be you know we should be very light touch as a as interventionists in the economy and we should look for the the optimal way to intervene rather in the new way of thinking i think we say no we're constantly learning we're constantly iterating on our interventions and policy needs to be adaptive the overarching principle should be adaptive policy rather than optimal policy and i think you know to some in some in some communities i work with that is very familiar and makes perfect sense in other communities particularly the traditional economic communities you know economic departments in places like oxford and lots lots of other places that's that's a that's a bit more of a you have to you find a bit more pushback against those ideas so i think these principles can be really useful we've then you know so we've got the empirics from the first report then those principles the kind of theory and then we have the third big report from the project which is the the quantitative modeling the detailed modeling uh, and that's what a couple of the case studies we'll see today are from so this is re this report it's a bit big it's one of those big heavy reports you put on the shelf maybe you don't look at very often but the fact that you know it's there kind of reassures you that the science is there to back up the intuition we're using day to day 
Um, it's really trying to deliver on the promise of new economic modeling, really try and, you know, people, it's easy to throw stones at traditional work and say, this is the problem with that. This is the problem with this. Here, we really try and show what that alternative is and construct something that is doing applied work on live policy questions, showing what these new alternative methods can do. And so we have a, a whole 15 of these case studies with many of them written and with policy partners, if not uh, in, in close collaboration with them on all sorts of topics. So there's this kind of global dynamics of the energy transition, then at individual country level, remember China, India, Brazil, and the UK, looking at the power sector, different industrial sectors, transport, agriculture, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a whole bunch of those case studies. So if anyone ever says to you, oh, these guys keep coming up with this and that, and they never deliver on the promise, point them to this report, which is where I think we really try and showcase this library of case studies. There's also some guidance on how to think about comparing and choosing these different types of models, which I think is really important when you people aren't sure where to start. I'll say a bit more about that at the end, actually, like where to where to begin. Um, the last thing I wanted to say before I hand over uh, to Fernanda to talk about the first example is, you know, why are we why do we bother with this new economic modeling? Why are we emphasizing that something's different here? Because that can be unhelpful sometimes. Uh, and I think the important distinction in our world is that the energy transition, you know, these interventions and these policies and these shifts we're hoping to see to address climate change are not marginal change. This is a transformation of the economy, of the energy sector, of the way we do things, the way our livelihoods are organized. So the, the methods that have traditionally been developed for marginal economic analysis, things like cost benefit analysis are no longer fit for purpose. And I think, you know, these methods are not appropriate everywhere, but where we have this transformational change, I think that's a really important reason to look for different methods. And these alternatives themselves, I think are really coming into maturity now. Some of these methods have been around for a while. Some of them even going back 50, 60 years maybe, uh, what's new, I think, is the really uh, pragmatic, a dogged approach to the, how they're used in policy analysis. People aren't just doing kind of nice theoretical models anymore. This is super, super applied, pragmatic stuff. And I think the data is also there now that they can deliver on the promise. You know, some of these models are quite data hungry. We need good data on the economy to underpin their design. Um, and I think we have that now. And the methodological improvements have come about such that we can do that. Um, so without further ado, I will hand over to Fernanda to walk us through our first example. Thanks, Pete. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks a lot for being here. Um, uh, I assume you can hear me well. Uh, my name is Fernanda. I am a research associate at the University of Oxford, and today I'll present our work on modeling labor market transitions, the case of productivity shifts in Brazil. Um, next slide, please. So in this work, we are interested in um, investigating occupation level unemployment, how we could be affected in different transition paths or transition scenarios in Brazil. Next slide. Um, in general, the, the overall idea in this project is that uh, a given transition policy or a transition path will cause uh, shocks to labor demand. And these changes to labor demand will then have to be cleared in the labor market, uh, therefore affecting unemployment outcomes. However, in practice, there are frictions in the labor market. So this unemployment impacts, they are heterogeneous. That is, uh, people in different occupations might be affected differently uh, by these transitions. So what we want in this project is to um, study how different groups are affected differently. Next, please. So just in, you know, being super brief, what we do in this paper is how do we model, how do we simulate this labor market impacts of the transition policies? We construct a data-driven occupational mobility network for Brazil in this case, and then we use this to structure an agent-based model of the labor market, next slide please, in order to uh, simulate the impact of two transition scenarios 
for Brazil's economy that we get from a working paper by our colleagues uh, Bento Ferreira Filho and Marek Hanush at the World Bank. Now, in the next few minutes, I will tell a little bit more about the context in Brazil and the transition scenarios that we work with. Then I will talk a little bit more about our modeling approach. And in the end, I will share one set of results with you just so we can have an idea of what's possible with this type of modeling. Next, please. And then the next. So Brazil is uh, one of the major greenhouse gas emitters in the world, uh, but most emissions there come from agriculture or um, deforestation, which is also linked to agriculture to a large extent. So the agriculture sector is uh, a, a, the main emitter in Brazil. But at the same time, agriculture is also highly productive over there, especially compared to other sectors such as manufacturing, um, in which productivity has been stagnant over uh, the last 10 years, at least, if not 20, and even declined um, recently. So within this context, next slide, um, there is obviously a lot of debate, policy debate, discussions in the literature about paths to net zero in Brazil. And our colleagues at the World Bank in their working paper, they contribute to this discussion by taking a, a macro structural perspective on this problem. So the idea in their paper is to simulate what would happen to deforestation and emissions if productivity were to increase in different sectors of the economy. So they explore a number of scenarios in their work, but here we focus on two. Uh, the first scenario that, work, that we work with is uh, a boost to productivity in agriculture. So if produ ag productivity in, agri in agriculture continues to increase. And the second scenario focuses on, uh, simulates the impact of a boost in productivity in manufacturing. So what they find in their paper is that if productivity in agriculture were to continue increasing, um, deforestation would decline because of the productivity gains, but still we would have more emissions essentially because of the impact of the agricultural activity itself, mainly livestock in Brazil. On the other hand, they find that if productivity were to increase in the manufacturing sector, uh, emissions would actually be lower after this transition. And that is because the energy matrix in Brazil is very clean. So there is room over there to increase the importance of manufacturing while still reducing emissions. Now, this is their paper. Uh, they don't look into labor market impacts. This is what we do. So next slide um, and one more. Um, so we look into for, for these two scenarios, what is the impact on unemployment and how do we do it? First, we translate the um, product level labor demand shocks that their model outputs into occupation level labor demand shocks. And then next slide, in parallel, we use data from Brazil's labor market to estimate what we call the occupational mobility network. Uh, this network, uh, gives what, what is the information that this network gives us? It tells us in each occupation, what is the probability of a worker successfully switching into a different occupation? So essentially this piece is meant to pick up on the fact that people cannot just switch into any new type of occupation if they want. So it's not reasonable to assume that say, a nurse would be able to easily transition into a new job as a lawyer just because demand for lawyers um, is high. So this is the type of friction of the labor market that we pick up with the occupational mobility network. Then next slide and next and next. Uh, with these two pieces of, um, of modeling, we can run the labor market model itself I don't have time to get into details of how the labor market model is set up, but what I can tell you is that when we run the simulation for each time step, we are able to estimate the number of people employed in each occupation and also the number of people unemployed in each occupation. So we are able to see how unemployment evolves during this transition, right? So next slide. I, 
Yeah, and one more. Yeah, so here there's a summary of the type of outputs that the labor market model uh, gives us. Um, a lot can be said about these figures, but in the interest of time, I will just say that each of these dots represents one different occupation. And the ones that are above the dashed line are the ones that um, face higher unemployment because of the transition compared to a baseline. So the occupations that are negatively affected by the transition and the occupations below the dashed line are the ones that benefit from the transition scenario. So we do this for both the agriculture and for the manufacturing uh, scenarios. And what we find in the next slide is that in the agriculture scenario, almost half of the occupations could be negatively affected by this type of transition. While in the manufacturing scenario, only 21% would be negatively affected. So there's a lot less um, frictions in the labor market and a lot less workers to support, say, during the transition, if the uh, uh, transition were to be based in increased productivity in manufacturing. So to conclude the uh, next bit, um, what we show here is that by putting these different pieces of modeling together, we find evidence that more attention towards increased productivity in manufacturing in Brazil is better aligned with the country's emission reduction targets because it actually delivers lower emissions, but also results in fewer labor market frictions. Now I'm up to time, but I just wanted to add that this that I've just showed you is just an example of the type of analysis that we can do with the labor market model. But the same way that we did this analysis for the productivity scenarios, um, as I showed here, we could do the same type of analysis. So put the labor market model on top of a di different scenarios, other type of policy analysis, other types of simulations, and then assess the labor market impact of a given policy. Um, that's it for today. Thank you very much. And I will be happy to take, to take questions later on. I think now I, I give it on to Fink. Hello, my name is Femke Nice, and I'm a lecturer at the University of Exeter. Um, so this work is in collaboration with Jean-François Mercure, UCL people, and in collaboration with um, a consultancy, Cambridge Econometrics, who's done a lot of um, this sort of new economic thinking. Next slide. Um, and we're going to look at the future of solar. Historically, models have been quite bad at predicting solar. And one of the reasons is that they include a floor cost. So in predicting how much cost declines will occur in the future, most models have said, we think that what we've seen historically will continue for a couple of years, and then it will probably meet out and become a constant price because of things around material costs. These predictions have been done for about 20 years and historically every time we've gone down and uh, breached those floor costs in models as you can see on the uh, figure here so on the uh, y-axis you see the costs uh, and over time and the green lines are these floor costs that have been included in these big models and constantly these floor prices are breached so what our type of modeling does is let's not assume that history will suddenly change and what happens if these empirically determined um, cost declines continue on. Next slide. So the model we use is a future technologies transformation model. Um, and this is the model that has the core feedback between deployment, learning by doing, lower costs and more investment. The dynamics of these models are based on investor choices. So rather than having an optimal energy system, we look at what investor choices do based on perceived costs, and they can have different perceived costs. Industry growth depends on current industry strength. So you can't suddenly, if something becomes the cheapest form of electricity in one year, become the biggest industry player. It depends on how strong you are in each region and inertia. You have lifetime of technologies. You typically would not uh, replace uh, a plant prematurely unless the economics really don't make any sense anymore. 
So this model has 71 world regions, and all of these world regions will have a different uh, industry strength, di different technical um, numbers for, for instance, your wind and your solar strength. And in all of these numbers, we have these investors competing against each other. Next slide. So what we find if we continue this historical trend of learning by doing, and also take into account the additional storage needs if you have a lot of solar and wind in your system, is that the LCOE plus system storage costs in between 2020 and 2030 make a flip. So in the, the years between 2015 and 2020, you saw quite a few countries where the cheapest form of electricity went from a fossil fuel-based electricity form to wind. Um, and in some countries to solar. And this switch to solar continues on. The main reason that you see this is that solar technology, which is very modular, is learning and is de decreasing in cost much faster than wind energy, which is also seeing historically very high learning rates and cost declines. Next slide. So if you aggregate all these countries uh, together, what you see is by 2060 in this modeling exercise, energy, solar energy becomes the dominant form of electricity production, uh, with another large role for wind um, and still some uh, coal and gas. And this is a scenario where we've not included any new policies. So we have the historical policies, for instance, a constant ETS price in Europe uh, for, for carbon but we do not include any new policies. And still you see that with this continued momentum of solar, it becomes a dominant form of electricity worldwide. Next slide. Well, of course, it's a modeling exercise. So we wanted to examine what can sort of uh, what barriers exist and what assumptions are really important to see if that's true. So in the, the top left figure, you see the histogram. If you do a couple of hundred of simulation with different assumptions, and you see that it, it varies quite widely, but there is a very strong uh, peak around 50 to 70% of electricity production from solar. One of the options that we have in a model in a default is that variable renewable energy producers have to pay for their own storage needs. Um, if we then say rather the grid pays, you see slightly higher percentage of uh, energy from solar, but not that much. Another important factor is the learning that wind energy experience, how fast do those cost declines? And if you have a very high learning rate for wind, then you can have quite low values for um, your solar percentage because wind then becomes the main competitor to solar energy. Similarly, if you have a very high exponent for solar, very high learning, you typically have higher uh, levels of, um, of solar. The most important factor, however, we found was the lead time of solar. Historically, we solar parks have usually been constructed within a year which means that it's a very easy investment to get your money back and to reinvest and companies can grow exceedingly rapidly. However, we see in some countries, for instance, in the Netherlands, where you have a very rapid solar expansion, that the grid doesn't really manage to do that that fast anymore. You can build them in a year, but you can't connect them to the grid. So sometimes these companies have to wait a year before they are allowed to deliver electricity. If this happens in more countries around the world, then that can have quite a large effect on the uptake of solar energy. Next slide. So historically, in a lot of these models, they say that the cost has been the major factor determining solar uptake. And now that we've passed a tipping point, we see that cost still has an effect, but that either solar or wind is likely gonna be the dominant form of electricity. Um, so the type of barriers we have to look at instead are different. And we identify four of them. 
we think that finance and when we wrote this paper, the interest rate hadn't shot up as much as they have. So we, we now think this is one of the most uh, important barriers to uh, to solar future. Supply chains, um, you, yeah, it's uh, the more you have, the more um, solar expands, the more important these supply chains were in some parts of the solar supply chains are quite vulnerable. Grid resilience, as I talked about in the previous slide. And also resistance from incumbents. Um, now that we are mid-transition in the solar future, you can quite rapidly lose employment in some of the, um, the technologies that are being replaced by solar, which can uh, lead policymakers to impose policies against solar. Next slide. So these four barriers require policies that go beyond the carbon tax. And what we suggest is in, in terms of finance that we should very much look at the barriers in the global south where this is a major barrier to solar uptake and offer guarantees to lenders, for instance, in multinational programs. Around supply chains, efficiency is really important. If you need less electricity, you ease those strains on the supply chain. In grid resilience, um, the imminent dominance of solar is quite difficult to do in terms of grid resilience. So one of the things that governments can do is preferentially invest in wind, invest in the small renewables and invest in flexibility options like storage and demand response. And to make sure that resistance from incumbents is, is not leading to new anti-solar uh, policies, just transition needs to be at the forefront of policies around the energy transition. Next slide. So to conclude, we model that a tipping point has been reached for solar and that in terms of barriers, we have to look not at cost, but at all the other type of barriers that might impede a solar transition around finance, grid resilience, supply chains and incumbent industries. To attack these barriers, we need to look at policies beyond the carbon tax. So for instance, deploying storage, finance, deploying wind, energy efficiency, um, and guarantees around finance. That Thank was you. me. Thank you, Femke, brilliant. Hopefully, I, uh, I hope everyone really appreciated those two examples. I think they're, I love seeing them particularly together because you can see how the the technology work that Femke and our colleagues at Exeter and Cambridge Econometrics are doing allows us to think about how technology is where they're going in the future, how that interacts with the economy. Femke didn't dwell on it there, but there's a whole load of macroeconomic word, work that sits alongside that. And then you can see how that can link in and be connected to the work on the labor market and really drilling down into the detail um, to get these really disaggregated, non-equilibrium economic modeling to give us really useful uh, insights for policy. Um, those two modeling examples, I think, are then a nice tee up for this next thing that Simon was going to speak to us about, but you'll get me for a couple of extra minutes instead today, which is risk opportunity analysis. And now risk opportunity analysis is really the idea here is this isn't another piece of modeling. This is a slightly higher level kind of conceptual piece of work thinking about what's the decision making framework that's going to allow these models to be most useful um, and we call it risk opportunity analysis because really we're we're mirroring here what what's happening in cost benefit analysis and so cost benefit analysis you know in particularly in the kind of global north in europe uh, and the us is really a dominant kind of decision making tool and policymakers really really like it for a lot of good reasons it's not there by random um, but we think as i sort of hinted at the beginning we think it's not maybe fit for purpose in the energy transition because um, because here we're talking about transformational change rather than marginal change, you know, making small changes to the economy, which is what CBA is well suited to. Um, and so, yeah, risk opportunity analysis, there's a, a journal paper with a lot of detail behind it uh, there and you know, hopefully fairly easy to find online. It's, the idea is it's really aimed to assess the kind of the dynamics of economic transformation. Uh, and I think this is one way, a really practical kind of policy focused way of implementing a kind of systems thinking, a holistic approach to policy appraisal. 
Um, one of the, th so I've kind of hinted at these here, cost benefit analysis assumes interventions don't change the system. So they assume, this is why, why I use this word marginal, you know, that uh, a policy only makes a marginal change. It doesn't transform the system. It also assumes that there's heterogeneity of stakeholders is, is that heterogeneity is low, that many of the actors we're talking about here, the economic actors we're modeling or modeling their behavior for, uh, they're, they're similar to each other. They make decisions in similar ways. And I just don't think that holds up so much for, for many of the reasons, even when they make decisions in the same ways, they face different barriers like Femke was talking about. Uh, and CBA also assumes there's certainty and quite, you know, even where there is uncertainty, we can quantify that. And I think it's not too controversial to say that's not true for the energy transition, where we see really heavy tailed uncertainty, where, you know, these kind of very uh, low probability, but high impact outcomes are, are present. It's not a normal distribution by any sense of, of the imagination, the outcomes we might face. There's also a fundamental uncertainty about where different technologies and sectors might go. There's systemic risk, you know, these different sectors are connected to each other. The economy is highly interconnected. We know that very well. That thinking about the economy as being an equilibrium or the power sector being an equal in equilibrium just doesn't make sense in this in this context. Um, and of, again, as I've said, there's different values and beliefs by different actors. So these assumptions that cost benefit analysis makes, I think, don't hold up. Uh, and I don't, this actually isn't that controversial when you speak to very, even very traditional economists, they'll sort of, I think they're fairly comfortable and they say, yeah, CBA is a good tool in the right place and we shouldn't misuse it. So we, maybe we do need an alternative in, in the context of, of the energy transition. And I think, you know, risk opportunity analysis is still relatively embryonic. It's still being developed and we're looking to apply it increasingly in different places. Um, but I think it has it has a, a, a potential value to be that alternative. And I just wanted to say a bit more about the detail of like, what is it that's different? You know, if cost benefit analysis is fairly intuitive, you weigh up the cost, you weigh up the benefits and you try and work out whether the policy is worth doing or picking between policies. What what's the intuition of risk opportunity analysis? And I think these are the kind of five those five bullet points. There are the or four bullet points, really, are the steps we we go through. I think the first one is to really map the system and make sure we have a really comprehensive view of what the system we are modeling or are interested in is or what the system this policy we're looking at is meant to be influencing what are the boundaries on it what are the interconnections and importantly what might be the feedbacks or the cascading properties that might be within that that system so we kind of want to do that first really understanding the system and you know that happens in a lot of policy but not not all um, we then want to do some of this more quantitative modeling, but really importantly, I think what we're looking for is, is looking for medians and distributions of outcomes, not trying to summarize down outcomes to a mean. And that's because we know there aren't normal distributions in these systems. These are heavy tails. We need to capture those distributions more, uh, more, uh, more clearly. And so the modeling that we do do should should be done in that way and focus on those estimating those types of outcomes. We should do that both for the positives and the the, the negatives, you know, the risks and the opportunities. We should also be exploring extreme outcomes. So I think you really it's, we use the phrase here: extreme outcomes and then best case scenarios. You know, hold hold those and don't have the hold those as outliers and that are very low probability and therefore probably we can ignore. Really put those front and center along with our our averages for describing what we think might happen uh, from these quantitative models. And then I think we need to put all of those things to decision makers. And that's where immediately a lot of people who work in policy start to freak out. We know, well, we're going to give you a 10 page report when they want a half a page summary that they can slam in front of their ministers and their senior policy teams. And I think that's one of the big issues that we are still working through is, you know, we can't summarize down the behavior of these types of policies in these in the in the transition with one net present value or comparing the ratio of cost to benefits we need something that allows us to capture these different elements the the system boundary the feedbacks best case worst case scenarios but to do that in a in a way that's digestible in the policy policy landscape so i think that's a challenge we haven't 
we haven't cracked that and i think that's still something we're looking to develop uh, i think there's also a perception that this modeling is maybe more technically demanding than traditional cost benefit analysis i think that's true sometimes but where the modeling capacity is well built up and and very and, you know, tried and tested maybe it, that's not so much the case um so yeah that's that's risk opportunity analysis and i think yeah there's a paper there if you want the gory the gory kind of academic detail if you look on the east website there's also some more kind of uh policy facing uh documents which try and describe and introduce risk opportunity analysis but i think it's important we have that conceptual kind of decision making framework alongside the technical modeling that we're that we've been developing okay so i just wanted to spend now a few sort of three four five minutes to bring things to a close by talking about this idea of how we connect things across the policy cycle and then we'll we'll come to questions i can see lots of questions are popping in do chuck them in the q a box um so how do we think about the policy cycle um this this diagram is probably quite familiar to most of you uh if not a source of kind of serial kind of pain that this this kind of idealized view of the policy cycle we know this isn't how things work but it's useful to break things down into kind of stages and think about how how what happens at different stages even though it's not even though it is an idealized description you know if we see this cycle around from agenda setting through to kind of policy formulation, decisions and implementation, round to kind of monitoring, evaluation and learning that we hope feeds back into the cycle. Here is a kind of way that I think we think these different types of modeling can be useful. So at the beginning of that policy cycle, this is where some of those more traditional approaches like optimization models, like those uh, forecasts or uh, these kind of optimal scenarios you see the IPCC produce, those big integrated assessment models produce, which give us these kind of goals and where we might be relative to our one and a half or two degree centigrade uh, goals. And I think when we're trying to set pathways or not even necessarily a pathway, but just the end goal, those types of models can be really useful. What about the models that we've been talking about today? This is where I think they come in slightly later around the cycle. So in that kind of policy formulation, that policy appraisal, that kind of ex ante stage where we know that broad idea but we're thinking about what might be the impact how do we design this this is where i think some of these systems and complexity methods can be really useful both qualitative as well as the, the quantitative when we're trying to work out what might how might these policies operate then i think when we get to policy implementation i think there's actually a big gap and we have a i'm not sure if it's a problem or not but there's not a lot of work we've been doing some review work looking at where these methods are used in the in the cycle and there seems to be a big gap around implementation you know we have implementation science as a field and they engage quite a lot with systems work but i don't know that there's a lot of detailed modeling qual or quant done at that implementation stage and really owned by by government or by by the the analysts working in government so i think there's a bit of a gap there then when we get around to the evaluation stage i think again we see a lot of work done and this is the work where secan has been really leading the way where we see systems mapping theory of change done we see a lot of econometrics and kind of data analysis because we've got the data now this ex post of the policy impacts and we do see a little bit of simulation modeling for kind of developing counterfactuals you know where we don't have experiments to run can we use some of the models like the like the one Femke showed us to explore kind of counterfactuals? And yeah, I think there's a role there, but maybe we don't see that as much as we might hope. So for me, it, there's a kind of a kind of obvious statement, which is kind of a, you know, motherhood and apple pie, everyone agrees. We need to kind of connect up appraisal and evaluation more. For me, what that means in practice is we need to have more trust of the qualitative methods at that ex ante stage that prior stage we don't i don't think we see that as much as we should we should see more of that kind of theory of change and systems mapping work done before a policy is implemented and then at the ex post stage where you do often see a bit of theory of change and uh, systems mapping work and not so much the quant work i think we need to see more of that quant work there at that ex post so we need to kind of boost them where they're used less and i would put as a bare minimum we need theory of change work and kind of rich theory of change work done throughout. And then that that work should follow 
the policy around the cycle. So it shouldn't be that we do it at one and then forget it. It should follow it around. And, you know, Pete, that's not new to say that people say that all the time, but it just doesn't happen. And I think one of the blockers, at least when I speak to analysts and when I can get them to be really honest, they tell me there just isn't that capacity or even maybe the ownership and buy-in from different professions in government, really thinking in a UK context, where there's different professions working at different stages and they don't all agree and have the capacity and skills and the buy-in about these different methods. And so we need to build that. Maybe risk opportunity analysis is part of that and maybe a risk opportunity analysis can follow a policy around the same as a theory of change or a systems map or a simulation model might do. Uh, and hopefully as a kind of combined package of quant and qual work, if it has followed it around the, the whole way around the cycle, that's more compelling to feed back into the next stage. And I think that does happen. We do get learning feeding back into the next stage, but that tends to happen quite informally and, and ad hoc. Um, so hopefully I've convinced you there's uh, value in doing these types of modeling. Uh, I do want to give good time for questions, so I won't dwell on the challenges, but just to say there are lots of challenges and we have to work out how to do how to how to uh, navigate those. I think the fundamental bottom line for us in terms of how to proceed, how to apply these methods, you know, we've seen two examples. There's a whole lot more. How do we how do we start doing this? I think the key is not biting off too much at one go. We need to start small and ramp up. It's not that we need to dive straight in at the deep end. I think systems mapping can be a, re we didn't see any systems mapping examples today, but I'm sure some of you have seen that in previous CCAN work or seen me talk about systems mapping before. Um, I think as an entry point for complexity ideas and these kind of dynamics ideas and uh, systems mapping is excellent. So I think that's a good starting point if you wanna start small. Um, I think as, as policy analysts or kind of policy making entrepreneurs or however we wanna see ourselves, I think we need to become advocates and see ourselves that we can bring these things to the different professions or different policy teams rather than waiting for them to come for us of course we need capacity and expertise that needs to be developed if it's not there well it doesn't how much so how much we advocate will will fail uh there is a lot of guidance out there you know we have the green book has a little the uk green book has a bit of guidance the magenta book has a lot of guidance that the secans contributed to but we need more of that guidance bespoke for specific policy areas i think uh and lastly i'll just do a little mini advert to say that you know east is part of our and secan too part of our remit is to do some of this training and so if it's if it's in individual methods or if it's in the wider approach to appraise or evaluation I think we need to think about that training and do have a look on the CCAN and East websites for, for information because there are a lot of courses we're running to do to do just that. OK, so I think without further ado, I'll we'll move on to Q&A. Do have a look on the East website. Hopefully it's easy to find. The link is there. I'm going to move us over to look at the Q&A panel and I'm going to try and share this. Hopefully those of you who've been asking questions have been voting on them too. Um, and I will try and pick the ones that have the most upvotes to start. So, and then I'll divvy them out. Forgive me if I'm uh, thinking on my feet. So I have one first question, which has had two upvotes. I'll start there from sort of anonymous. So hopefully not too brutal is on the labor market model. So I think this is one for you, Fernanda. Um, the question is your labor market model doesn't look like an agent based <clears throat> model. What interactions are there between the agents and what do their agents represent? Workers? Question mark. Okay, thanks, Pete. Uh, if I may, uh, a lot of the questions are about the labor market model, so yeah. I think I can answer them in one go. I can yeah, address yeah, them because they are because they are related. I'll try my best at least. So uh, before we talk about the uh, the labor market model itself, I wanted to clarify. Yes. The uh, question by James, uh, the total factor productivity analysis is a result, is done with a CG model, is a traditional analysis with Cobb Douglas production function in, you know, traditional mainstream methods. Um, so, and, and then again, uh, how does, how does it relate to complexity? Well, so we take the outputs of the CG model, uh, among which uh, there are uh, the labor demand shocks, and then we use a complexity-based uh, approach, so uh, an agent-based model of the labor market to uh, simulate how those labor demand shocks 
will impact unemployment. So the complexity really is on the modeling of the labor market, not on the modeling of the economy, of the emissions or deforestation that we take from the CG model. So the idea here is to showcase that these approaches could be also complementary, you know, um, but it's not, you know, but our use of the labor market model is not limited to uh, analyzing outputs of traditional economic models. We could analyze output of any other type of model. Now, the ABM model itself, because some questions are about that. And like I said, I didn't have time to get into the ABM model, um, but um, how agents interact. So who are the agents in this ABM? The agents are occupations. So it is as if each occupation is a continuum of workers. And these occupations, uh, workers in these occupations, they apply for jobs and that's when they interact. That's where the interaction between the agents uh, take place because they apply for jobs by looking into the vacancies. And also after they see the vacancies, they choose which ones to apply for based on the, uh, occupational mobility network based on the probability that they uh, have that they will be successful in getting that other type of job. So if historically the chance of a nurse switching into a job as a lawyer has been very low, the agent will not put the effort into making an application to that position. It, they will prioritize the other positions according to the occupational mobility network. And then the occupations interact in this process because some will get jobs, others will not get jobs, they will become an employment, and then they will try again for a new job. And in the meantime, uh, workers are being fired and hired by firms according to this labor demand shocks that we get from the other model. So the agents are occupations, they interact as they apply for vacancies if they lose their job, um, and they might get a new job or not in continuing this process. So that's where the complexity is. Um, there was another question. So code for the labor market model is available, but not for this application. Uh, it's available for the US modeling. Uh, for this, we are still working on the working paper and in the future, ideally we will also share the code to replicate the results, but that's not available yet. But you can look at the references where the model was developed first and applied first in the US. Um, and there is code there. So I think I answered ah, in terms of what, what is it, how agents make decision. Um, it's not rational expectations. They choose how, where to apply based on what they observe his, as if they observed historically where people from the same occupation were successful in applying. So in a sense, it is adaptive. It's the occupational mobility network that is the main piece of information that guides the choice of uh, job seeking. So that's not, it's not rational, rational expectations in there. I, I think that clarifies all the questions about the labor market. So I'll hand it to you. Thank you, Fernanda. Yeah, that looked pretty thorough to me. I think the, okay. I've, as, as Fernanda's worked more closely than I have, but the, the ABM, I think it is, it's, in some levels, it's quite an intuitive ABM. In other levels, it looks quite different because of the way it's connected to other models and the way it uses uh, data to create this occupational mobility network. But for me, it really is the agents are, the agents are looking for jobs in different occupations and they're restricted by that network and their interaction is indirect. You know, if there's a lot of people employed in one occupation, then that agent can't go and get a job there. So that they don't have a direct interaction. We don't have trade unions. We don't have family ties. We don't have social networks. Of course, mm -hmm. we could add those things. The question would always be, how does that get us further to our aims? How do we underpin and validate those additions? So, yeah, but thank you, Fernanda. I'll go to the next question uh, that had uh, the most votes, which was from Stuart. Um, and I'll have a, I think I'll have a go at this, but then Femke, maybe this is one that you might have a, a feeling on, a, a view to as well. Um, so the question is, how suitable are the ex ante models to periodically model black swan events, which we will certainly see more of in the future? Uh, ben says, if it's certain it's coming, it's not a black swan. Uh, aside from the def you know, arguing about what black swans are, um, I think this is a place where 
these types of approaches take us further, but not all the way to where we might hope to be. So for me, these kind of ex ante models, which capture the dynamics of a system, particularly agent based models, which are very good at capturing emergent behavior and maybe kind of outlying behavior and the same way Femke described, you know, the distributions of outcomes by their kind of probability. You know, we saw that model, which isn't even necessarily an agent based model, but captures the dynamics It's disequilibrium at least, um, uh, it, it, you get a sense of the distribution of outcomes. So how often those extreme outcomes might be. And I think these types of approaches do take us further to working that out than more traditional to CG models or DSG models in, in economics. Uh, and so I think they are useful. But of course, if there really is something entirely radically new that appears and affects the economy, that we just haven't even thought of how to represent that in the model, then of course that's not there. So we're not all the way. Did, is there anything you wanted to add to that, Femke? Yeah, so I think there's two things why these models are more suited to model this than traditional models. One is the importance of feedbacks in these models. What we do is a first step in, in whatever type of model we do is really put all these feedbacks in. And if you have a complex system with loads of feedback, you can create these long tailed distributions depending on your initial set of assumptions, that, which you can vary. If you don't have that and you assume your economy or your system is in equilibrium, it's really difficult to perturb your model and to get some of the known unknowns in the model. Um, of course, the unknown unknowns are always really difficult to model. A second reason why these type of models work really well is that they're very suited to narrative and scenario uh, work, where, again, you have a larger freedom, which is both a blessing and a curse to determine what your scenario is going to be if you use a simulation type models, which has loads of inputs and doesn't always assume your economy is in equilibrium compared to traditional models. So. Yes, but we can't do all of them because there's a lot of unknown unknown in black swan analysis. Thank you, Femke. I think that's definitely true of the labor market model. You know, one of the critiques we get sometimes, which I think is fair, is we don't know what the new occupations of the future might be. And so we can't capture those in the model. Um, and that's so that's it. But those are the types of issues I think we need to keep reflecting on. Um, next question was from Kerry. She says, could any of these types of methods be useful for other non-energy domains uh, that also contemplate transformational change? For example, could they be used for redesigning a policy related to agriculture? Uh, I think I'll say I'm happy to say a couple of words. I don't know if Fernando or Femke jump. you want to jump in, please, please do. For me, in agriculture, absolutely. There, and these types of this type of work is being done in agriculture. I think you have a lot of big land use modeling uh, done. Uh, often a lot of those are more agent based in nature, some of them, not all. Uh, and I think we're thinking more and more about how we connect those up. Um, so I think there no, absolutely is applicable. I'm not on the top of where how far things have gone, but there's definitely people working on that. Uh, people like Michael Obersteiner, I know for sure, uh, have been doing that. Um, Fernando Afanka, did you want to add anything on other domains? The, t the type of modeling we do, we've applied to the steel transition as well as energy transitions, and we're also building an agriculture model. Um, so yeah, it's definitely uh, possible as long as you have these, uh, you can quantify the innovation in a system, you can use these FTT models. I, it's just sprung to mind, actually, there's a model from the there's an agent based modeling group at Santana Institute in Pisa, and they have a model called Agri Love, catchy name, Agri Love. And that's I think that's been published quite recently. And that's a, this type of approach, but applied to agriculture. That's that might be a nice example to start with. Um, next question was from Henry. Uh, good, nice. Thanks for joining us, Henry. He says, how much interest in these approaches are you getting from policymakers? Uh, my two pence on this is actually the strongest interest is coming from people in the policy space. Not Maybe they're not senior policymakers all the time. I think the strongest interest is from analysts uh, of all of all levels, actually. Uh, you know, we've had really great attendance from junior analysts at some of our larger events we've we've spoken at. But I think we also get really good 
demand pull for these methods from quite senior analysts in government. On the policy team side, I think maybe it's more mixed. Where we're definitely not getting demand is from traditional economics departments, where uh, obviously we're, what we're doing to some extent feels like an attack or a critique. I, I would kind of hope that it's not, but I think that's the perception sometimes. Those people have more of a stake in the existing methods. So I think that's where you don't see the demand. So I think the policy side actually is most, the, the demand for these methods is most strong from the policy side. Um, Fernando or Femke, did you have anything to add on I that? think that's also reflected by the fact that a lot of our senior East people have been uh, employed by the World Bank now. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, we, so um, there's a lot of interest from that angle to to change because they, they have traditionally relied only on equilibrium models and decided to open up their modeling uh, capacities to these kind of methods quite strongly. Yeah, yeah. I think we're us three are obviously in our own little bubbles, but I think we've really seen a shift in where people are working. And uh, yeah, we, some of our team members have been stolen from us to go and work in uh, institutions like the World Bank. So I think that I do think that speaks volume, of course, in our in our own bubbles. I'm very conscious of time. It's gone two o'clock now. So I think we do need to draw things to a close. Apologies to the few questions that came in uh, that we didn't get to. Um, feel free to drop us an email or I'll try and pick those up as well. Uh, and get back to people. Um, I just wanted to say a huge thank you to Fernanda and Femke for joining us today. Thank you to CCAN for hosting us. The recording will be online. Do check it out, pass it on to others. And yeah, so thanks everyone for joining. Hopefully see you again soon. Bye-bye. Bye, thanks everyone. Bye.